Hi, this is David Weinberger. I want to talk with you about my, my new book, Everyday Chaos, Technology, Complexity, and How We're Thriving in a New World of Possibility. Uh, I'm sorry, I have, I have a love-hate relationship with subtitles. So. Um, the book is about a change in how the future happens, or our ideas about how the future happens. And I think this change is is epical. I think it's, I think it's a really significant change, and it's happening right under our noses, which for me, I guess, is covers a lot of territory. But uh, this sort of thing, so the concept of our idea of the future has been interesting to me forever, um, as is the fact that this is happening without our noticing it. Because one of the things that has always brought me joy, bliss, um, you know, I, I went to, I, um, I taught philosophy for a while a long time ago, and this is also one of the reasons I really loved and love philosophy, um, but of a particular sort. Um, it, and certainly as a writer, the thing that brings me the most joy is being able to examine something that is ordinary and discover and show how it's actually extraordinary. It's in many cases, it's just weird. And we have so many examples of that now um, right before us. Um, so the old idea of the future that I think is being overturned is too strong, but um, is being challenged. Um, it should be familiar. So it's that there are many more possible, the further out you look, the more possibilities there, there are. And as the future approaches us, or we approach it, the possibilities narrow. So the movement of the future is sort of this narrowing, narrowing, until you just have one possibility, and that's the thing that becomes real. And our job is to try to make sure that the possibility, the single possibility that we want is the one that becomes real. Um, so I think we see in some of the our um, techniques that we have evolved on the internet for purely practical reasons, I think we see a change in this idea of the future. So I want to give you a couple quick examples um, and then talk about machine learning because uh, much of the book is, is about machine learning, um, which I think gives us a way in which we are beginning to understand this change in our stance towards the future. So um, so here's just a couple quick, quick examples. If it's 1908, and you are Henry Ford, you're about to launch the Model T. Model T is going to sell for 19 years with basically no changes. Some very minor little tweaks. A huge success. 15 million cars, Model Ts, are sold over the course of the lifetime of this, this product. Ford was able to do this because Ford successfully anticipated what customers were going to want. And this is totally normal. This is how we've done things for, for ages and ages. Ford just did a great job of it. So um, the roads were terrible because they're basically horse paths, and, and so the car is going to have to ride high to avoid the mud. And then, um, almost all your users are going to be first-time users. They, they, so the, the user interface has to be incredibly simple. And he just totally nailed it. 19 years, 15 million cars. This is designed by anticipation. Absolutely common. We, uh, we will continue doing this even after even though we're doing other things now as well so let me give you an example of an, a different thing that we do now online um, many companies launch uh, by launching minimum viable products <clears throat> which is a version of the product that does the least possible thing does it well but only does the, the single thing or the small set of things so when dropbox launched um, it did one thing really really well it let you work on your files wherever you were using the cloud. And over time, it started to add more and more features. It was an MVP, and it did that because rather than Dropbox trying to anticipate what its users would want, it instead launched it and saw what users wanted. And users could see what they really wanted. This is just a really solid way of launching products, and lots of products have done this. But this is the opposite of, of design by anticipation. This is designed by unanticipation. This benefits by holding back, by refraining from anticipating. Another sort of example, um, Slack is a really great messaging app for, for teams. It scales up nicely to a corporate level. It's done incredibly well very, very quickly. It was also uh, an, MV, um, an MVP. 
So Slack's, you know, at this point, full-featured product. Um, they put up an open, an open platform, which is uh, a pretty common thing to do these days. So an open platform allows any, anybody, any developer, to use um, a strong subset of the functionality that Slack has developed um, in order to build a new product. Um, and developers can do that in many cases with open platforms without even asking permission or registering. They can just, just do it. This, in, this means that products that Slack would not have thought of, because Slack can't think of everything. Nobody can. So products that somebody in the world thought of that Slack would not have get built. And products that Slack, even if they did think of it, the, the product's too niche for Slack to build. It also means, and really importantly, that um, Slack gets integrated into other products into, and into, thus into um, workflows, uh, uh, Teams workflow. And that makes Slack, each of these makes Slack more and more valuable. Open platforms are another example of designing by unanticipation. Rather than the company trying to figure out exactly what everybody needs the way Henry Ford did very successfully, Companies are now finding additional value, uh, finding value in allowing others to extend their products in ways that they did not anticipate. Open platforms, unanticipation multiplies value. In a, that is so different from our old assumptions that to succeed, even to survive the future, requires anticipating as carefully as possible. In some sense, I think this this way of thinking, which is very common. It's not just in those two strategies. It's all across the internet. The internet itself is about opening up, making more things possible without constraint, at least not many constraints. Um, this is a reversal of, of the flow of the future, right? The future was coming towards us and narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. And now we think about the future as opening up. We, what can we do to make the future less predictable, more things possible? Then along comes machine learning. So let me tell you quick, as quickly and simply as I can and I, uh, how machine learning works. And I'm bound to get this wrong, but I'm going to do the best I can. So traditional computing, if you have a project which might be to uh, write a program that will predict quarterly sales, the developer um, determines one way or another what the factors are that that affect quarterly sales, which are things like how many people in the sales force, how are they incented, um, what's, what's, uh, how many leads are there, um, and the rest, and then what the relationship is between these factors. So if you raise incentives, maybe you'll um, sell more, but it will drive down profits maybe, um, I mean, who knows? So you figure out those relationships, the factors and their relationships, and then you run your, your program. And it's great. And if this sounds like a spreadsheet, that's exactly what it is. A spreadsheet is just a really good user interface for designing a, for writing a, a program. Um, okay, so that's not what, what machine learning does. The traditional way, the programmer has a conceptual model that she turns into a working model. With machine learning, you don't start with a conceptual model. You start with data. You feed in lots and lots of data. The data is just numbers. You do not tell the, the computer, the machine learning system, how you think those numbers go together, what, what the relationships are. You just feed in tons and tons and tons of data, and the machine iterates on it, applying uh, advanced math and statistical analyses on, to discover relationships among the many points, when I say many points, we can easily be talking about millions of pieces of data and tens of thousands of, of the equivalent of variables. It just looks at these and it finds relationships and it builds an incredibly complex map of this, this affects this to some degree. Each of the relationships is weighted and you end up with a neural network that can be so complex that humans literally and simply cannot follow it. Um, these can be uninterpretable, un inexplicable, which is very concerning, right? And I understand that. Um, there's also controversy about how inexplicable and how inevitable inexplicability is. Uh, let's leave that to the side. As of now, some of these are inexplicable. The concerns are, um, in part, that machine learning is learning from 
from existing data, data, data that represents the current state of the world, and that current state is highly biased against, well, we all know about this. And so the machine learning may learn exactly the wrong things, repeat those biases, or even amplify them. That's a very, very serious problem. And there's a lot of work and thought being done on it, which is, which is necessary and wonderful. It's not what the book is about. The book talks about it at times. And inexplicability um, plays into this because uh, if, if, if you can't, if we can't understand how it's, the machine is doing what it's doing, how can we be certain that it's being fair in what it's doing? These are very real questions. As I say, not what the book is focused on, but I, I want to, it's really important to acknowledge these at least. Um, so machine learning gives us a new model of how, of models of how the world works. Many, 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 many little pieces that in their incredibly intricate um, relationships of probabilistic and weights, everything touching everything else, um, it may well be that it doesn't simplify in ways that we can understand. The world just may be that complex, that chaotic, that subject to vast changes based upon a small change, as the butterfly effect. Um, and if that's how we're thinking about how the world works, I think that changes a whole bunch of things. If that's how we think the future happens. Um, in business, and much of the book is focused on business, um, it, we, are, we are already seeing changes in how businesses think about strategy in a world like this. And I think we're going to see more of that. Um, how we make decisions. Because the, the, our classical way of thinking about decision making is that you are standing at a crossroads. You've got two choices, or maybe five or ten, but something, you've narrowed it down like that, and you pick one. And you do so on the basis of having some confidence that you can foresee where that path leads. But if the world isn't like that, if the world is more like a machine learning model, and one of the reasons to think it is like that, by the way, is that we use these machine learning models because they work. Um, if the world is more like that, then decisions are not, you should be so lucky as to have two choices. But in a world of so many complex interrelationships, that's not how we make it. That's not what a decision is like anymore. Um, uh, what does it mean to uh, have a career in a world like this? How do we gather information? What does it mean to gather enough information in a world of infinite, not just infinite information, but infinitely connected information? The book talks about these things. Every chapter has, though, a coda, in, which is designed to allow me and readers to think about... Um, different sorts of issues, which I think are, are at least as important. Um, so what is, how do, what, what do stories mean in a world that's revealed as being this complex and intricate? Um, what are explanations? What have they always been? What are they now? What is the role of explanations? Um, how do we organize things? It changes our notion of organization, I think, when it's this vast and complex. Um, what makes something moral? I mean, not the book has no predictions and it doesn't preach any moral principles or anything. The question instead is, what makes something moral? Um, even what makes something meaningful? What is the meaning of meaning? I think all of this is coming usefully unstuck now. And if we're confused... And I think we are increasingly confused. I am not at all sure that that's a bad thing. I think it's a proper response to the magnitude of the changes that we are living through. So I'm, that's, that's roughly what the book is about, I think. I hope you pick up a copy. I, I, hope, you, I hope you like it. Thanks very much.